Section 3A, this I call it as a black and white section for the most part. Why? Very, very numerical in nature. Okay. I would say that the effort to reward ratio is as good as it gets, right? Because if you are focusing on the three pillars, remember I introduced the pillars, pillar one, this is as good as my drawing gap, right? We have the circuits, we have the graph or, you know, torque speed curve and all that stuff. And what do we have? Phasers, right? So in circuits, I would say equations and graphs, I would say, you know, torque speed curve uh, and uh, yeah, relationship and then phasers. The the one that really connects everything together is phasers. In fact, what I told you guys is that some of the advanced concepts, like how does power factor impact voltage drop and voltage regulation? You can memorize that, right? Improving power factor helps you with voltage regulation, reduces the voltage drop. That's one level. But then that's the limit of your knowledge, right? If somebody scratches and probes you, you're going to be like a deer with headlights um, in, 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 in his eyes, right? So to get deeper understanding what we did, right, both in the context of the P-Power exam and to improve our understanding as a good power systems engineer was we basically went deep in phaser, correct? Because once we understand phaser, we can explain all the graphs. We can explain the equivalent circuits. We can explain the equation, all right? And we can explain those abstract concepts related to why this happens when this happens. And we use those phasers not only in section three. Remember, as late as power flow diagrams and power system stability, when we were looking at variation of load, right, and how it was impacting PM versus PE, I mean, these phasers kept on coming up again and again and again and again, right? And there's no reference to phasers with the exception of one tiny phaser diagram that they have for synchronous machine in the reference handbook. But all good quality advanced textbooks emphasize this. And this is how I myself learned the equivalent circuits and the graphs and the ins inside out basically of, uh, of, of, of these topics. Okay. So let's quickly go through these generator motor applications. So actually let's read the whole thing because they are all so interrelated that individually identifying them is probably um, not meaningful, right? Individually rating them is not meaningful. So induction and synchronous machines, how are we going to rate it? Medium to hard. So let's call it medium to hard. That's fair assessment because there's a lot going on here. We have tons of equations, right? We have equivalent circuits. Then we have approximate circuits and the induction machine I'm talking about and, and, and the more accurate circuits, okay? And we did discuss why it's worthwhile to consider the approximate circuit. Generally, they have one to 2% off. All the calculations are gonna be roughly one to 2% off, right? When you move the entire code up front and then have the input voltage applied to the code as well as the series elements simultaneously, right? Put the series elements in parallel to the code and so on and so forth, okay? So there are a few moving pieces that you need to keep track of. Make sure you do all the study guide prompt sets here, guys. They are progressively built on from easy to more difficult problems, right? Um, and try and visualize in terms of power flow diagrams. So look at where this particular loss is happening, what that really means, where we need to include a three multiplied by I squared R type of stuff when it's we're talking about three times on each single phase right uh, so it's going to be 3x and then if you're talking about the losses in the field circuit for synchronous machine why the three is not included so a lot of small points like that and obviously voltage regulation why we take just the absolute values and so on so a lot to keep track of and definitely one of the areas where you should spend time okay now electric power devices i would say lion's share belongs to transformers right um so how do we rate transformers we have the equivalent circuit for transformer we have the phaser diagrams for transformers we have the auto transformers right so there's a lot that is going here going on over here especially with the auto and parallel operation of the auto of the transformers right um the handbook uh, basically um limits itself to single phase transformers, but we looked at three phase transformers as well, right? We looked at circulating currents. We discussed um, why the voltages have to be perfectly equal, right? Otherwise we get circulating current. Um, so as far as derivations, and that's a good point, um, as far as the derivations are concerned, I'm a big fan of derivations. I've derived practically everything that I could, right? In the context of the P power exam. And my recommendation has been to go through derivations at least once. You don't need to go through derivations again and again and again and again, right? It's not a high yielding activity. 
in the context of the P power exam. Now, a lot of students who pass right the exam, they do uh, ask me, Vasim, can I keep access to the program for X number of months? And then if you guys are interested, we can discuss that. But the reason is that it's a good refresher to go back to the basic. The direct answer to your question is that go through the derivations at least one, right? Once you've gone through them, you know, you know how it's, it's how the structure is created, going through them again and again is not going to be worth it. Then we focus more on the practical side of things like fault analysis. We take the diagrams that are given to us, the sequence diagrams, and our focus in live training was how to extract equations out of it. Remember that guys, we didn't discuss derivations. We didn't have to, right? We looked at some of the basics but we were very comfortable uh, dealing with that. Okay, But I'm not recommending you to skip the derivations. I myself put in a lot of time and effort, right? And as I told you, you can go through, you know, scroll through the internet, right? Look up on YouTube and stuff, right? And even textbook, right? Those derivations are extremely, I would say, laser focused to the point, And I don't leave anything to assumption. If there's any assumption I'm making, I tackle it. I, I The way I can um, basically develop those derivations was assuming that I myself don't know anything about it. And I put myself in the shoes of a student who's going through it for the first time. So there's a lot of effort that's gone through them. Okay. Uh, that's been put into them. All right. Reactors and capacitors. How are you guys going to rate these guys? Easy, medium, hard. Just a couple of new equations, essentially. Right. So let's just call it easy. So overall, not too bad. Obviously, the main show is transformer right? That's the center of attention. Okay. So please make sure that all the complicated concepts that we've discussed, you deal with them. And that basically buttons up section number three. So section number three is where we really pick things up in terms of talking about more abstract concepts. In FE Electrical, the transformer we knew was an ideal transformer. The only thing you had to know was that VP divided by V secondary was actually equal to A, and this was equal to IS divided by IP. That was it. Or there was another equation that P is equal to ZS times A squared. That's it, right? But now you're talking about even the turns ratio, that is something called actual turns ratio and effective turns ratio, right? Yeah. And then with the auto transformer, there's no longer an electrical isolation, right? And we can have additive and subtractive configuration, correct? Obviously, the delta Y phase shift, yeah, 30 degrees. The other thing with the auto transformers was that, unfortunately, the handbook equations that are given, like they have just one type of additive configuration that's mentioned over there, and the formulas are not necessarily as helpful, correct? So how do we deal with it? We rely on dot convention, which is a little bit painful to understand, but that captures all possible scenarios, right? And so many other things, right? We encountered in transformers and same thing can be said about induction and synchronous machines. So section three is really where we start, you know, playing in the big league, right? Um, all the general stuff, all the basic stuff has been covered. And from this point onwards, we are basically flying at a higher altitude. Mm -hmm.